Welcome back, welcome back to another episode. Guys, today with me I have the only and only Nate Brown. Nate is well known for being the co-founder of CX Accelerator, public speaker, someone that shares with passion what serving in this industry means. So without further ado, join us for a great conversation. Let's go. Nate, how are you doing? Welcome. Took us a few... Um, days months maybe yeah <laughs> we did it it, it took us it. some time andre but we are we are here we are connected and i'm thrilled to be here thank you for your flexibility in this no thank you thank you for your flexibility as well so before any further ado nate can you tell us a bit about yourself what's sure. your journey and we'll yeah. get from there it's been a funky one i started <laughs> after college trying to sell postage meters off the streets of jacksonville florida wasn't very good at that but what I ended up loving doing was coming in when somebody had a postage meter and doing customer service. And so that that's kind of what awoken this desire to do customer service inside of me and sold vacuum parts out of a storage unit for a while in Nashville, but then was able to hook up with what a job that would later become UL, Underwriters Labs, and was, was doing customer service, entry-level customer service for this great safety science company and just absolutely thrived in, in the midst of that love the ability to connect with folks, to bring them along a meaningful path, you know, as, as a subject matter expert in a particular area, as that customer service representative, in this case, on a safety focused learning management system, and ju just came alive in that role and eventually took ownership of that team. And um, it became a department as we acquired some healthcare tools and different things into us. And so that was so, so exciting and a great company, great leaders, you know, there. And so was, was able to grow quickly and there came a moment, Andre, when I was like, you know, I'm, I'm tired of taking tickets. And that was kind of the, the customer service mentality we were in in the time. It's like, hey, let's just wait for the, the phone to ring or the email to show up. And I was like, why, why are we taking the same problems again and again? Let, let's think upstream at, for, and find friction. And I read The Effortless Experience by, by Matt Dixon, Rick Delisi, others. And it absolutely went to me. Uh, and and it, it, it ushered me into a, a customer experience mindset. And I've just never looked back. And, and now, like, my curiosity is still just stoked uh, in terms of the, the opportunity that we have to engage customers in a very holistic way, a very proactive way, and to do customer service differently, to do marketing and sales differently, to do it all differently, and through a very customer-centric lens. I, I love your energy. And, and by the way, let, let's start here. So we were together a few months ago at SWPP. We were. Where you were a speaker. You did a pitch where you touched about the being customer-centric, the importance, some of the principles behind it. Uh, and let me let me start there because I think this is a, a part that connects not only us, but I think every professional within this space, which is the centricity around around the customer. How have you seen that evolving over time? Because you start doing these speeches over time. Did your content change over time? Oh, gosh, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, my, my content changes from day to day. Uh, me and Jeff Toyser were having a hilarious conversation <laughs> about this, walking around uh, the domain in Austin. Um, it, it's a blessing and a curse for me, right? Like, you, I never know what's going to come out of my mouth. <laughs> I, I've got concepts, you know, I've got guide rails, but like, the stories, the the connections that are going to be made, um, I, I never know. And it's just it's just a spillover of my joy in doing this work. You know, I, I love it, but you know, the most I guess you could say the most recent iteration of what I'm excited to be presenting on is this idea of this servant challenger mentality, Andre. And it, it's so relevant in a customer service universe, you know, where we're trying to, to help folks to be able to guide customers to their definition of success. And that requires a lot of attributes. It requires a capability, a curiosity, a confidence, like you know, all, all these all these amazing attributes. And it's like, how do we how do we make a customer service or CX professional really come alive to to make these attributes spill forth and, and to engage them in a different way? And and it starts with that idea of challenger. And if you look at the original circle of psychological safety, it's so brilliant to me. You know, the Timothy, Timothy R. Clark original circle of psychological safety. It starts with, I'm part of the team. I'm included. I feel safe here. I'm not going to get a knife in the back. 
I'm not worried about just protecting my safety. And then it starts like, I can learn here. I can safely learn and start to connect dots. And then I can start to contribute as level three. Well, level four is challenger. I can start to challenge the status quo. I can start to break inertia. And Andre, it's inertia that's, that's killing most organizations from being able to innovate from a customer experience standpoint. I mean, the, the supernova highways that form in our brain, we, we don't want to have to think hard. We don't want to have to expend extra energy. We just want to go with the flow, go with the motion that the organization has set forth in front of us. And as human beings, we fall into that pattern. But like w- what we're asking folks to do is to break the pavement of the highway. Let's form mm-hmm. some new connections up here. Let's get that curiosity going so that you can be a more effective guide for the customer. But it's hard. It's hard to get somebody in that state to where they want to change. They can visualize the change and then you push them over to where they're actually willing to form those new connections and they're excited to do it. Mm-hmm. But like that, that's what we're trying to make happen, Andre. Yeah. There was a word I think someone mentioned. I, I think I'm sure you asked, there was a point you asked it for a few words. There was someone that mentioned courage, which takes courage to do that stuff. Yes, it does. And, and very often it's a courage that is really, really hard to gauge because it's not only a courage that within your organization, but you, you need to kind of like, transcend yourself because you need to, you, you need to act differently. You need to create an impact differently. Uh, I want to take a bit back on your journey. Where was the moment you, you took that courage out to become who you are today as a reference within, within this space? Wow. What a, what a fascinating question. Golly. I, I mean, it really was, I, I, I think it might've been around this time. There, there was some great advice that I got from a mentor of mine named Marshall Martin, wonderful business leader. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away um, a couple of years ago in, in, a, in a, he's doing what he loved. He was an incredible triathlete and he was in a tragic cycling accident, but it, it just, it makes his advice stand out in my mind that much more. And he, he was telling me, he's like, Nate, you got to have the laser focus of an Olympic athlete. He's like, you're trying to do all these different things. You want to be all things to all people. You want to know everything. You want to do it all. It's like you're not going to make an impact doing that. It's like you, you've got a gift for customer service. Drill in, drill into that. Become, become the very best you can be in that area. And I just remember being like, man, that's, that is what I need to do right now. Like, cause you know, in, in my mind up to that point, I was kind of viewing customer service as just that, that portal, that entry doorway to the, the bigger jobs in the organization and the opportunities to have more impact and influence. But right there is like customer service is beautiful. It's wonderful what we get to do right here. And I've got a gift for this and I, I want to become the very best I can be and start to help others on that journey as well. And I'm not saying everybody has to lock in, you know, lock yourself in a particular box, but I am saying you should be seeking like, what is that area where you can go deep have that laser focus of an Olympic athlete so that you can make a big impact for your organization, for the people you serve. That's a good, healthy exercise. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I love that. And that touches quite well on the topic I wasn't going to bring. So at WFM, one of the things we have been covering, not only is the workforce management role itself, but also the impact it has on the organizations. And you mentioned about, we spoke about courage. We spoke about that focus and that really helping in excelling in, in, in one specific skill. I've been seeing from a conversation we actually had together, but from other folks that we, we spoke recently is the ch- there is an ongoing change, not only in contact centers, but in workforce management as well. The skill sets are evolving. Mm. What's your take on how the skill set is shaping the professional of today? That, that need that is getting there. You can feel it, even though you yeah. you might not know what it needs, what it is, but you you see something creeping. Uh, the walls are creeping in for sure. Whew. I like I love how you say that, Andre. That what a cool word picture that is. I, I'm not going to pretend to be a workforce management professional. I, I just want to be very upfront with that. I know you have a very advanced audience on this podcast. I'm amazed at, at what a true WFM professional can do. Dan Smithy, Todd Hicks, and I'm looking at you all, the incredible people I met at SWPP, just blown away by the unique skill set of, of you. And I mean, if I, if I think about WFM of the past, it was just getting butts in the seat, just get the butt in the seat. <laughs> 
and start the clock, you know, just, just minutes, you know, it was like a, a, a work of minutes and, uh, Ooh, you know, that's, that's good. You know, that's important. That adherence conversation is critical and you do have to have the right people in the right place at the right time. But my goodness, the work to me is evolving so much where now it's like, okay, what's the mindset of the person that's sitting there? So they're ready. Like the, the bell rang and they're in the right place. Now, what are they going to do with the time? <laughs> it's not just about being there. It's about being alive. It's about being ready to serve. It's about unlocking their gifts and helping customer service professionals to not just be ticket takers. Cause that's what we do. We just, we shove them in these little tiny boxes when they, they could be voice of customer ambassadors. They could be innovation machines with all the things that they're learning from the customer interactions that they're having. And, and we, we don't create opportunities for that. And so when WFM leaders create space and make time and make a culture, an atmosphere where that type of curiosity that servant challenger mentality has the ability to happen. It's amazing to me. Touching on that. So that mentality is, is also something that based on what we were seeing, so that people that seek the opportunity and that being that courage, uh, not specifically speaking about the workforce management professionals, one of the evolutions, you mentioned it quite well. So it was just getting the people at the right place at the right time. It's been like something they've been saying for more years probably than I, than than the ones I, I can count, but it changed. And the expectation from the CX professional specifically on your role today on the ones you you advise changed. You don't you expect more from a workforce management professional. Good. Can you give a few examples of like where you want the FM to be on the table to help you make decisions? Yeah, I mean it's 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 margins. It's like okay, let's be very realistic about what a human being can and should be doing. So, so here's, here's like the window of time that's, that's possible. Now let's, let's think about emotional bandwidth. <laughs> let's think about how activated these people are. Let's think about total motivation, that brilliant idea from that comes from prime to perform where it's talking about the presence of intrinsic motivators versus those external motivators that suck the life out of people in their jobs. Let's talk about the presence of total motivation so that as we think about the margins that we need to create, the energy that's present that we can tap into to not just survive the day, let's make new things happen. Let's make the experience better. And like the WFM professional gets to kind of sit on top of that conversation and make it possible. First of all, make people want it because a lot of times it's just that cost center conversation. All right, how can we get through this? How can we minimize cost? You know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, no, this we know, we know, Andre, we're, we're so far past that. Like the customer service center is one of the most strategic forces in your business. We're still very much in the age of the customer. If you're falling asleep in the contact center, if you're falling asleep in the customer service center, you're not acquiring new customers not nearly at the rate that you could be. That's why customer success is surging because people have seen the value, the, the ability for great experiences, especially in this area of customer service, to lead to new customers mm -hmm. and to expand that share of wallet conversation. Otherwise, you're just it's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So let, let's get past that. And the WFM leader gets to talk about, okay, let's create the margins. Let's create the space. Let's in, insert the right motivators, the right capabilities to where these folks can, can do the very best that they could possibly do to be the guide and bring the customer to their definition of success. Cause that's what makes the business healthy. Mm -hmm. And what do you think the role is on the employee experience? Because this is something that often disregarded the WFM for sure has a critical role on the satisfaction of the employee as well, which yeah. then it's, it's like a compound effect to, to the customer experience as well. For sure. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I love how Denise Leone talks about you, you can't give somebody a gift you don't have. <laughs> like th it's going to be a soulless attempt if, if you're if you're always giving something that you yourself do not have. So the, the first gift that is given is to the employee. It's a good experience. It's the type of experience that we want to then take and pass on to our customers.
If that's not being given to you as an employee, it's going to be a very shallow, shallow attempt for you to give, 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 and there's nothing coming back in. You're going to burn out so quickly that inauthentic, that, that inauthentic attempt to give catches up with people so quickly and customers are smart. They can feel that. They can feel it very quickly. So we, we've got to have that, that employee experience foundation, that gift that is given, which allows us to pass on well. And I, I, I really appreciate what you said about that being a gift. Um, and you cannot give someone, I don't know who mentioned that. Kudos Denise Leon. Yeah. I could could to Denise about that one. Uh, cause that, that transcends not only the experience itself, it connects to the skill set we, we were saying before. You, if you want to exceed into something and you don't know that, you need to work that out to actually be able to then create an impact on that. Example, mm -hmm. let me try to make an analogy here. You work on a team and you are frustrated because you are not helping decision making or you are not being at the seat or that you believe that you should be in because of certain factors. If your work is not providing an impact or enabling something for you to be there, you cannot blame the person that is not giving you the opportunity. So you need to work to get that gift to give so that yeah. is granted a new opportunity to you. And I, and I feel sometimes many people just hope that everyone recognizes they are there, but they are not working on that gift that they can do to continue to move on on their career. Yeah. Oh, it's tough. It's tough, Andre. I mean, let's be honest. Most customer service centers, the tool sets are broken. Oh, There's yeah. friction all over the place. You know, the, the I heard from the Cloud Security Alliance report, this is back in 2018, but a mind-blowing number. The average enterprise organization has 464 custom applications inside of it. And like 34% of those are customer facing. So think about the customer and, and the agent, the customer service worker trying to navigate such a chaotic, broken digital ecosystem. So yeah, yeah, it's going to be hard to be the guide if if the journey is just broken across this ecosystem, if information is impossible to find. Yeah. And and then you layer on the cultural elements. Like, you know, you think about, you know, the people process technology, right? That's the technology piece. Let's think about people. Do you have peers that are supporting one another? I mean, that, that is the true attribute to me of a great customer service environment, the ability for peers to support one another. If all you're doing is creating a competitive cannibalistic environment where you're just putting up on people on pedestals based on metrics and different, you know, remedial data here and there, rather than creating the type of culture where, where customer service workers want each other to succeed want the business to succeed, the customer to succeed. Like that's a desire that is so obvious as soon as you walk in. Like that's what you're trying to foster, not like peripherally motivating super specific behaviors with individuals. <laughs> it's it's so much bigger than that. Couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, Nate, let's shift gears a bit um, to touch upon another subject. I don't want to go too much on the subject that I think it's not saturated, but everyone is speaking about AI and the future and automation. But I want to touch a bit on, we did a research in the past where we touched upon what are the things that people are working towards into the future? What are they expecting about the future? And I wanted to have your view on what do you feel like we should prepare more in the more immediate future? Less about like what we ain't expecting three years, but what do you think there are things that we should focus on now that we might not be paying enough attention? Of yeah, I'll, I'll offer two. I'll offer two there. So knowledge, knowledge management, knowledge curation, creating knowledge curators. That's a term that I used in a, in a blog that I recently did with Sprinkler. We'd love for you to check that out. I mean, it's that idea of getting smarter with every customer interaction and together, like our customer service workers become knowledge curators. It's fueling one another. It's, it's fueling the customer in terms of their, their capability, their knowledge level. It's fueling the self-service capabilities. And, and eventually, you know, that generative AI capability, you know, machine learning is going to be a lot better if data is well curated inside the organization. And, and, our, and our customer service workers are uniquely gifted to be able to do that. So, you know, bringing in something like a knowledge-centered service methodology 
laying that that on with good tech uh, and extending that beyond the customer service center to have good knowledge curation across the business you know that that's where things actually become less siloed that's where customer service becomes customer experience at a higher level at a more proactive level so that that's where a lot of people need to be focused that's a huge um, enabler for oh any organization in the world so much and, but like where i think the the next big horizon is for cx professionals customer service professionals is cultivating community community led brands are those who are just excelling right now in terms of gobbling up market share um building the brand uh by mark schaefer is a great resource on this um actually i, I apologize um who is the author of that one he wrote belonging to the brand but building the brand uh, is kind of a companion resource written by another author whose name is slipping me right now. Both of those are remarkable resources, um, but it, it has illuminated to me the opportunity for CX professionals to be community builders. And so we have this amazing brand promise, right? The, the organization got started for some unique reason. Like we can do something better than anybody else. Let's create community through that, through that meaningful brand promise. Let's bring the right people in and co-create with them. Let's not just be providing services. Let's be making a difference around that brand promise together and inviting our customers into that cycle, that process. I mean, this has been happening in, in some spheres for a long time. I mean, let's face it, the gaming industry. <laughs> they had I was gamers. going to mention that creates a huge community. I mean, look at Discord. Like, it's amazing. Like, people had so much pride around this game, the digital identity associated in these areas that they wanted to help others to have a great experience. So you have gamers supporting other gamers just out of the goodness of their heart because they love the thing, the game, the universe that's been created there and, and their pride around the studio, you know, the creators of that game. So like that's been a community led industry for a while now in many ways, but now we're seeing that happen in, in other spaces in SaaS. You know, you have these knowledge experts that emerge on Apple technologies and other things that are now supporting each other. They get a great sense of identity from that. There's a great source of pride through that. People are getting served very quickly in a very authentic manner through different threads and community vehicles. Now it's spreading into like healthcare in certain ways and, and all these other exciting places. But like, I feel like there's some kind of community conversation that needs to happen in every industry and for every brand at some level. It, you know, some areas it makes a lot more sense than others, and it, it will manifest itself differently. But but the big question is, how are you creating community for your group of customers, and and how are you bringing them into a true mechanism where you can earn loyalty, listen to that voice of customer feedback that happens in a great st uh, tr structured environment? You know that that you have as a community vehicle. Uh, you know, these are the questions that great CX leaders are asking right now. And I think that transcends. I, I love this neuronal network around the community because it, it, the truth is, if you think about it, it happens not only to your brand, but it happens to professionals, for instance, CX professionals or yeah. even workforce management professionals. I know a few communities with LFM. We have others in, in the space that have their own community. And it's by creating the time together and bridging that community and crossing nodes that you learn, that you evolve, that, that then you, you drive into a different level of experience, right? Sure. I really like that connection. I think it, it plays a huge role, um, not only collectively as a, as a community, but as, a, as well as individually, because, and this is, was going to be my, my next question, which is more about uh, any advice you would give to someone starting now, either on workforce management or on the CX space about what what to develop first, how do I choose um, my next one? And one of the ones I normally recommend is finding a mentor. Go and oh, ask yeah. someone that can mentor you. And this is you creating your, you basically saying, I am a node in this network that exists. Yeah. How do I start to connect? Absolutely. I mean, it, it's having people around you that can fill you up. I mean, right, we're, we're fountains, we're spilling out, we're serving, <laughs> serving our organization, serving our customers. We gotta have fountain inputs too. So get into the community. There's an incredible CX community out there worldwide. Uh, join CX Accelerator. You know, it's a great digital Slack channel. Uh, it's a great place to jump in and get going. Um, but, you know, engage locally too. 
uh, you know, through different meetups and different things, you know, that, that inspiration is going to serve you through your entire career. But then frankly, you know, if you want to get more specific about where to get started is like a, a, mm -hmm. a WFM professional or a CX professional psychology, organizational psychology, learn it, know it prime to perform as an incredible resource to get you thinking in, in those ways, you know, that, that idea of intrinsic motivation, why do people actually work? What are they thinking about? What's holding them back? You know, gain, gain a sixth sense in this area of organizational psychology. It will mm -hmm. not let you down. I, I love that sixth sense. And I, actually, this is something that, I don't know if you connect to this, but one of the most common reflections I see professionals that are, let's say one, to two years in a new job. And I'm speaking about CX, the WFM, but I, I think we could argue that this will work to anyone is they start realizing the importance of not only communication, relationship management, understanding and anticipating the needs of the others, which touches exactly on what you said, that psychological part, that you normally realize how important it is as you are getting more mature in your own role. Mm. And then you that's when you unlock a door of potential because you then start seeing things differently. Uh, I don't know if you agree with that. Oh, very well said. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, otherwise you're just doing a job <laughs> and you're a victim. You're a victim of, of people's behavior because frankly, you don't understand it and you're just going to end up frustrated. Why didn't that work? I did all the things. I checked all the boxes. You're going to continually be frustrated in your career unless you can answer the question of why. <laughs> how how can i serve and understand people and navigate them towards meaningful outcomes it's nudging you know that that's a brilliant resource there that's another great psychological thriller the book nudge you know we we as as customer experience professionals we are choice architects and we're nudging people softly kindly edifying them down certain paths and we, we've got to be aware of those paths, aware of the people and their mindset. Otherwise, we're just going to continue to be a victim. Yeah, I love, love that one. Nate, let me ask you a tough question. It's tough, I think, it, because of how open it is. But being a, CS, a CX professional, um, one of the questions we normally ask on the WFM space to a few guests is, if there was one thing you could solve in your space in your industry let's assume there is no risk of limited you have unlimited resources and limited money you could do anything what would be the one thing you would try aim to solve so many things are running through my mind <laughs> um i mean i i'm trying to think of something fresh here but i, I but i'm not because it's just it's that important to me i i, I would solve this matter of the heart this matter of motivation I, I would want everybody out there to be serving a, an organization with a meaningful purpose. You know, they're, they're doing something good. They're doing something unique that is helping people, helping communities, and, and that they feel activated in the pursuit of, of that promise of that mission. Because you know, if, if we get that piece more in place, people aren't just going through motions. You know, inertia isn't crippling our ability to actually do new things. And to protect the brand promise, you know, if, if we've got folks that are in an organization for a very specific reason, because they align to that brand promise and they're free to serve well, you know, they're activated in terms of their ability to, to defend that brand promise and to guide those folks to their definition of success, which, which matches that capabilities of that organization. So much of what we get stumbled around is going to go away. It's going to evaporate. It's going to become a non-issue. If, if we had that that alignment between mind and heart. Yeah, I, I think to a certain extent, I don't know if you really, this feels like a cultural issue. Like, I don't know, it's hard to identify. But I would love to figure that out to multiple things, but it's, it's, it's a tough one. It's a mind. It's your mind plays tricks with you sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I love how Justin Robbins talks about this. I heard him talk at an ICMI show and he's like, you know, we, we see people that are held back, right? Like we see that they're not going on all cylinders in terms of creating great experiences. So, so what is it? Is it an issue of the head, the heart or the hands? <laughs> do, do I have the knowledge? Like, is the knowledge here? Do I have the desire? 
but like my hands, they, they're not working. Like I don't have the data I need. I don't have the tools and resources. I, I can't use my hands. Probably not. That's probably not the problem. You know, the, it probably starts with like a lack of knowledge of the customer, of the business, you know, of, of the things that are going on to where you can connect the dots and create the mini marriage ceremony that happens in a great customer service interaction. You have the customer need and the business capability. You're marrying those two together in a way that only a service professional can do, but you got to have great knowledge to do that. Or maybe you don't care. Maybe it's more of an issue of the heart and you're just going through the motions. You're just waiting for the day to be over. You died in your chair two years ago, but you have to do this job. And to some degree, you're a victim of your own job. Where, where does the problem lie? Head, heart, hands. I, I I don't want to ruin. I think it was an amazing, amazing recommendation. Any final words? We are getting to the end. It was a pleasure having you uh, on our show, Nate. Any final words to leave our guests with? Yeah, get excited about this work, yo. I mean, get curious about it. Like, <laughs> We're, we're getting the like customer experience is still new. Like absolutely nobody has it figured out. Like we, we together are, are laying the foundation for what customer experience will become. And it will continue to be an absolutely critical business function. It's way too important not to be. So let's, let's get excited about our, our hands, you know, getting dirty in, in the building of the foundation of this work. Let's support each other in that endeavor and and ultimately be able to do incredible things in protection of the brand promises that mean so much to us. Let's serve our organizations better because of us being able to support one another in this great work of customer experience. Being Get into one, that community. One <laughs> great community. That's exactly what I was going to say. Nate, thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you on our show. Thank you. And to everyone that wants to follow Nate, Nate, you are a public speaker. You have been on loads of shows. Please reach out to him. If you did not know Nate before, I'm pretty sure you will love these conversations. Thank you so much, Nate, for being with us today. Thank you so much, Andre. Thank you, everybody.